no, no, no. What's going on? What's going on? This doesn't even make sense. Where's God in all this? How, how could he even allow this crap to go? Oh, no. What am I going to do? Oh, I got to give somebody a call. Let me get my phone. What's my phone? Hand me my phone. Hurry up. This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online. Starting at the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. I'm going to repeat that. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. All right. Now, <clears throat> let's get down and dirty, y'all. One thing the Lord gave me a revelation of years ago, and that is the same way it applied when I started reading this, when I believe the Lord led me to the scripture, is sometimes we want to curse the darkness. When darkness happens in our lives, we as human beings, it is natural, only natural to our flesh, to want to curse the darkness. <clears throat> but God knew what to do with the darkness. He didn't get rid of it, did he? He only divided the light from the darkness, but he did not get rid of the darkness. Do you find that interesting? Hmm. Yes, I do. Well, anyway, starting... <clears throat> Talking about verse 2. Sometimes when we are in different stages of our lives, we run into periods where there is no answer, there seems to be no direction, nothing makes sense, we don't get it, we wonder where is God in all this madness. And for us, Everything looks like it is without form. It's chaotic and void. We lack the joy. We lack the peace because we're so frustrated with the situation. And darkness is upon our faces like it was upon the face of the deep. But God, but God, you know, you have to remember who's walking with you in your darkness. You have to remember God's light dispels darkness, but the darkness doesn't completely go away because, and for those of you who say, why, 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 we live in a, in a fallen world. The earth started in the darkness. God's creation began in darkness. So darkness serves a purpose. And sometimes the darker your days, the darker your situation, the more brilliant God's miracles will be. The more brilliant and the more <clears throat> amazing God works those miracles. He works them in the most amazing way. They will shock you. They will surprise you. They will, they will floor you. You will be wondering, how did he do that? Because his ways are above our ways. That's how. That's why. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He's above our finding out. There's just no getting around that. So before you get all bent out of shape, <clears throat> when darkness starts to loom over your head, Remember, you may be caught by surprise. You may not have even seen the signs of the storm coming. But God already knew it before you were born. He knew what storms you would face. And it's not about, <clears throat> excuse me. 
It's not about the storm. It's about how we handle the storm. What do we do with it? How do we relate to God through it? Do we blame him or do we cry out to him? Do we run from him or do we run to him? Some of you, the darkness is of your own making because sin lieth at the door. But some of you, the darkness just caught you by surprise. It's out of your control completely. And it can be a combination of many things. A demonic attack. It could be a test. It could be a learning experience. It could be a period where God has you on a threshold. And he wants to move you up. But he can't move you up until you go through a certain thing or two. And as long as you're going through a certain thing or two, God can teach you. He can develop you. He can, he can, dis, he can de, depart wisdom and, and impart. That's what I was looking for. He can impart wisdom into your heart, into your spirit, into your mind. Because you will learn from the vicissitudes of that trial. You will learn from the vicissitudes of everything going on around you, your circumstances, the cloudy days, the darkness where you can't see your way. Have you ever been in the darkness where it's so dark you can't even see your hand in front of you? Years ago, I was up at a, at a Christian retreat and it was a bunch of us standing on the, on the, um, on the pathway we were trying to get from point A to point B. And the guy who was in front of us had the flashlight. And the guy behind us had a flashlight. And we were in the middle. And they were lighting up the pathway for us. And they said, everybody stand still. Don't move. And they turned the flashlights off. And they said, we want you to see just how dark darkness can get. And we were holding our hands up. We... They were like, do not turn to the right or the left. We don't want anybody falling off cliffs up in here. But we just want you to see how dark darkness can get. It was, you talk about blinding darkness. It was so dark. I've never seen darkness like that in my life. Imagine what it must be like for a person who's seen all their lives and then they're blind from a health issue like mine husband like my late husband you know we don't realize how dark things can be but I want to share with you no matter how dark it is you may not be able to see your hand and you certainly may not be able to feel God and it may not make sense how God can be anywhere in that darkness or involved in it but God is right there y'all he's closer to you than your own breath and you may not be able to see him because of the darkness that's in your spirit. But he's right there. He's right there. And all you got to do is think on him. Say his name. Talk to him. Cry out to him. You may not be able to say a mumbling word, but you cry. When you cry, you cry to him. You don't just cry in self-pity. Cry to him. <laughs> he recognizes your cry. He knows the difference. Just like a mother whose baby cries. They know when the baby's crying because they're wet. They know when the baby's crying because they're hungry. They know when the baby's crying because they just want attention. A mother knows the difference between a baby's cry. God is that much more in tune to us. So don't think you're in the darkness by yourself. If you find yourself there, don't think you're by yourself. <clears throat> it may look like everything is without form. You may feel void and empty inside. Everything might seem so dark that you that is blinding to you. It's, it's almost like a state of confusion for you. Rebuke the confusion and ask God to shed his light in your darkness. Ask him to give you some perspective. Ask God to show you your bearings so that you don't get turned around and end up 
falling in the long run. You get me? Falling in the long run. All right. So when God dispels his darkness, <laughs> when God dispels the darkness with the light, with his light, you begin to see. His light will show you where you are. When those two guys shine their flashlights up in, the, up in that mountain, on that mountainous path, we could see the cars where they were parked. And we could see where the edge of the cliff was too. And yes, there was an edge of a cliff. So God will shed his light so that you don't fall off the edge. God will shed his light so that you don't make a hasty decision that can harm you or someone else. God will shed his light. But will you acknowledge the light or will you ignore the light and go your merry way? And trust me, Mary will not be very merry when you get through messing things up. The best thing to do when it gets dark in your life is be still and know that he is God. Years ago, God gave me an illustration. We had a meeting. It was an overcomers meeting. And you can try this in your house. I mean, anybody can try it. It's not dangerous long as you're sitting down and you know where the light switch is. Sit in a room that hardly has any light at all in it at night. And keep the lights on for a while so that your eyes get acclimated to the light. Then instantly turn the light out. And that's what he had me do. He inspired me to have someone turn off the light switch. And we were sitting in a circle. So we all knew where we were pretty much. But when that light first went out, we didn't have time to get acclimated to the darkness. So the first thing I asked everybody is, what do you see? They couldn't see a thing. A little, a little glimmer of light peeping out from the corner of the blind up in the little teeny weeny window. That was above the garage door. That was it. But down below where we were, mm -mm, we couldn't see each other. I said, now, let's just sit and chit-chat for a while. And wait about five minutes. And I, the first person starts to see something, tell me what you see. Just speak out as you start to see things. And different ones started to blurt out, oh, I'm starting to see the circle a little bit. I see the form of the of where we're all sitting, okay? And someone else said, uh, it looks like uh it looks like a female sitting over there to the right with something in her lap. Okay, okay, things are starting to lighten up, aren't they? Well see the thing that you'll start to realize is the longer you wait and you become acclimated to the darkness, the easier it is to maneuver even before any lights get turned on. And that's why you have to wait on the Lord. You have to wait on the Lord, y'all. You can't jump up hastily and start trying to run around uh, looking for flashlights and candles. And you're in panic mode and you're hitting your shit on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, on a, a piece of furniture. And you're bumping your knee on something else and you're... You're tripping and you might even be falling half the time, trying to scramble around, grabbing some light wherever you can get it. Uh -uh. Be still and know that he is God. No matter how dark it gets, y'all, be still. Because see, the thing you have to always remember to ask God, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to understand from this? What are you developing in me? And what are you gouging out of me? Because the darker it gets in your life, the more of your flesh will rear its ugly head. Why? Because you're battling your own natural fears, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what's going on, 
You're battling your fear of how much worse it's going to get. You're battling the panic mode that we tend to jump into. We have to literally at times rebuke ourselves when we're in the middle of a surprising situation like that. And we have to ask God. We have to quote that word in the middle of the darkness. Mm -hmm. He will keep me in perfect peace if I keep my mind stayed on him. So is your mind going to be stayed on him when the lights go out? I'm talking figuratively now. Or is your mind going to be stayed on the darkness? Because the more you concentrate on the darkness, trust me, y'all, psychologically speaking, the darker the darkness will seem to get. The more painful the darkness will seem to get. So, <clears throat> remember, whatever life brings your way, be careful not to curse the darkness because God's in the darkness. He's right there. Do you notice it said in the beginning, God? <laughs> he was there before the darkness could even be acknowledged. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Here's another thing God does in the darkness. He's working, y'all. He's working out all the details. He's working. He's already got your answer. All the things are right there in his mind. The plan is laid out already before the darkness rears its ugly head. Remember that when the lights go out in your life. God's got a plan. Now, I'm going to share this real quick. Uh, I'm not always trying to talk about my husband, but okay, I can't help it. So let me get on the human side for a second. I honestly believe, I remember Milton had several failed marriages, but I honestly believe our marriage probably would not have been as glorious and heavenly as it was had Milton, it was like a, the best, the best and the worst you know how they say the best of everything and the worst of everything? His health was the worst. But our relationship was the best. And the relationship, I mean, the, the, his health is what humbled him, softened him, tenderized him. And I honestly believe that he was remade in the darkness. He was recreated in the darkness. Because there was a sweetness about him, the sweet aroma that came out through his vulnerability to the sicknesses that he had to deal with. And sometimes when you look at scripture and you see what Jesus said, if your hand offend you, cut it off. It actually means that you're cutting out the things in your life that can cause you to trip up in the Lord and allow sin in your life or sin in your heart. And when you see that happening, what does Jesus say? Cut it off. Now, he says after that, it's better for a man to enter heaven missing body parts because when they get there, they're going to be whole anyway. But when they enter heaven missing body parts, then it is to go to hell every whit whole. And what that means is you don't want to go to hell with your body fully intact. You know, everything in your life is going great. Everything is perfect. You're in seventh heaven right here on earth on cloud nine. I'm feeling fine on cloud nine. No, that's fine. But are you going to hell feeling like that? Because when you get to hell, that cloud nine feeling is going to be long gone. So what God does sometimes is he will allow things to happen in your life to tenderize you, to soften you, to sweeten your disposition. And you have to go through the phases of mourning, of sadness, of anger, of, 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 of all of that. 
fear, all of it, all of those things, but you have to go through it with God. You got to hold tighter to God's hand going through those things. You cannot shuck his hand away, curse the darkness, curse God, turn your back on God. Uh, how could God allow me to go through this and all of that? No, that's the time you get. The closer you stick to God, y'all, the sweeter he is. The closer you're in him, the lighter your darkness. Till you begin to see the beauty. You begin to see the beauty of it all. So what I was saying about Milton is there was a sweetness that came on him that wasn't there. There was an edge that was there before he lost his eyesight. But after he had been blind for a while, and then after we got married, I noticed there was a major difference that started to come on him in his character, in his disposition. He wouldn't lash out with his tongue. He was holding, he would use that self-control, check himself. Sometimes he'd say, baby, pray for me. I'm having a bad attitude day. And it was a difference the way he approached life and all of its challenges was different over time. He sweetened like, you know how they say wine gets sweeter or a person can get sweeter with age? That's what he did. See, some people get bitter and harsher and they're stuck in their ways and they're rigid. They're difficult to deal with. They're they're uh, rambunctious, they're frustrating, they're frustrated, they're, they're contrary, as the old folks used to say from the country. Oh, they're contrary. Well, some, some of you old folks, you're getting older, you get more contrary. You don't see it. But the people who live with you do. And some of you are young and you're contrary, and you don't see it, but your parents see it. So... What you have to realize is God will allow things in our lives to shape and mold us, to reshape, remold us, chip away some stuff we don't need in our lives anymore. Chip away and gouge out some stuff, cut up and cut out some stuff that we don't need in our hearts anymore, that we don't need in our attitudes anymore. And I'm telling you, Life can bring some stuff that'll blow your mind, but for the grace of God. So you have to concentrate on God. Before we knew it, sitting around that room, we could see who was sitting and where they were sitting and what they had in their lap and what they were wearing. By the time about 15, 20 minutes went by, we were all acclimated to the darkness and we could see quite well, thank you. To the point where one could get up, walk across the room without tripping over anything and turn the light on. So when you wait on the Lord, darkness loses its power over you. Whoa! Thank you, Lord. Darkness loses its power over you. And sooner or later... It becomes powerless. Milton's blindness no longer got him down. He was a happy camper because we reveled in the love God put in our hearts for each other. We enjoyed the simplest things in life. His pride was not always in the forefront. It got to the point where it was non-existent. You couldn't even smell it. You couldn't even detect it. His pride was gone. <laughs> so God knows how to reshape us. I always ask God, Lord, if you got to correct me, if there's something in my heart, in my spirit, my attitude, my fiber that doesn't line up with you, would you find the most tender way to deal with it? Please don't take me to the woodshed. <laughs> Please don't throw me in the darkness. Help me deal with it. Help me acknowledge what you see in my flesh that you don't like. 
so I don't have to learn anything in life the hard way. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will raise you up. Whatever you're going through, stay humble. Ask God for more and more humility so that your pride doesn't and your and your arrogance doesn't turn a 13 day journey into a 40 year ordeal like it did with the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel. Whatever you do, ask God to help you shorten that trial as, as short as it can be, where it stops hurting, where it no longer bothers you. You see what I'm saying? Because as long as you focus on that darkness, the pain feels more intense. The darkness seems to be getting even darker and darker. Your anger flares up. Anger can turn into bitterness. And you're bitter towards God. Before you know it, you're walking away from him. And you hate everybody. You're angry at the whole world because of what has happened to you or what you're going through. Mm-mm. God can take the pain out. Let me share this and then I think I'm about, well, anyway, let me just share this. We'll see what the Lord does. Years ago, my first marriage, I was married to a real sweetheart. He was kind. He was sensitive. He was um, fun. He was fun. Uh, let's see, highly intelligent. Oh, my God. I didn't have the intelligence that he had in his pinky. That man was intelligent. He was very thoughtful, all of that. But he had one problem. Well, two, but one, the main one that I'm dealing with now was his addiction. It was not to crack. It wasn't to dope. It wasn't to drugs or alcohol. He wasn't addicted to gambling. Brother man was addicted to pornography and prostitutes. So the first three years, you talk about darkness, he first committed adultery the second month of our marriage. Now, having walked with the Lord and experienced him personally, having experienced God, I mean, I recognize that God doesn't always solve a problem overnight. Sometimes you have to go through it from one end to the other to its completion before God releases you and says, I got it from here. And you have to remember when God was dealing with you in some of your little madness, it was not an overnight success. Some things were, were instant. Some things took a decade. So you have to be willing to wait on God to let you know when you can usurp your rights. And I knew after two months of marriage, I could have divorced him. But I asked God, as long as you want me, because that's what I did. I waited on the Lord. You hear me? I asked the Lord, number one, help me forgive him. Number two, take the hurt out. I was hurting y'all. We were in the honeymoon stage, and he was already out there committing adultery. I didn't catch him. He confessed it. I, you know, he confessed it. And God had prepared me for the confession because he gave me a dream. Don't think those folks act like they don't know what's going on. They don't. God oftentimes is telling the other person a whole lot that you're not hearing about because they're also being told, don't talk about it. Just pray about it. So anyway, here I am, you know, because God knows it all. I don't care what you do in the back in the corner in the dark. It's never too dark for God to see like it's bright daylight. So I dreamt he was in the bed with another woman. And I thought, oh, what a crazy thought. But I didn't throw it away. I just put it in the back drawer and prayed on it. Sure enough, three days after that dream, Kirk came home soaked with tears he came home to confess what he had done that week. So what I saw, God was showing me, yeah, he, he's doing it already. 
And when he confessed that he had, had got hired a prostitute, uh, I had to go in the other room. I didn't deal with it right then. Some of y'all try to deal with stuff before you go to God. You have to put on Christ sometimes because sometimes when things happen in your life, you're not ready to deal with it and you don't and you better stay hands off and keep your mouth shut. So what I did was I said I'll be back. I'm going to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom, I locked the door, and he said, "You want to talk about it?" I said, "Kirk, God has to deal with me first before I can deal with this. So please just, you know, be quiet and leave me alone until I have time for God to minister to me right now. That's what I need. So that's what I did. I sat in that in that room for about an hour and a half. Me and God. Just me and God. And after I got through pouring my heart out, crying my heart out, asking him questions, all kind of stuff. I can, when I got out from that room, peace was all over me, y'all. The heart was gone and the ability to forgive was right there. So, um, afterwards, yeah, we talked a little bit and that was the end of that. Well, it wasn't the end of his addiction. This is what I want to share with you. We got to the point where he was saved. We got to the point where he stopped going to church out of embarrassment. So here I am. A new bride for the first year of my marriage attending church after about six months by myself. You talk about embarrassment, humiliation. I'm thinking they're going to blame me. They're going to think that, that I did something to Kurt. I just knew it because I have this outgoing, boisterous personality. And because I'm like that, people can assume, oh, she's the one wearing the pants. Oh, no, baby. <laughs> that wasn't the case. Kirk was a mouse in public, but he was a lion in the house when nobody could see him. So what I want to share with you is sometimes in your darkness, you have to deal with the way other people see you. You have to deal with the embarrassment. You have to deal with your emotions. You have to deal with feelings of betrayal. You have to deal with the pain. Oh my goodness, it, it, it is something when, you're, when it gets real dark like that. But the beautiful part is when God's in there with you and you're in there with him, the darkness does not have power over you. That's the beautiful part. You and God have power over the darkness. So after another year, I started gaining weight because now... I'm eating my emotions away. Every time he left the house, I'm wondering, is he going to be with a prostitute? I'm not going to run around chasing him. He's a grown man. But I would still have that in me. And I realized after three years of anxiety, of gaining weight to the point where I look like the Goodyear blimp, I realized, I mean, I was sitting there one day eating and God shined a light. It was literally like he shined the light and zoomed the lens in on my hand. And I realized I'm eating my emotions away. This is not the way it's supposed to go. And I put everything down and I cried and I asked God to forgive me and asked him to please help me focus on him at every moment, every second, every hour so that I am not depending on on outside things to appease my hurting emotions. And I went out in the backyard and I said, Lord, here is the adultery. Lord, here are my feelings of betrayal. Lord, here are my, my feelings of being unattractive. Here are all of my fears. Here are my feelings of, of jealousy, of, of everything I could think of I was throwing at God. And I said, and Lord, here is, it, I named the husband and here is his adultery and blah, blah, blah. So when I got through, I said, Lord, you have to carry it. It's too heavy for me. I'm killing myself going through this emotional upheaval every time he does it. And it's not changing anything, but you can change me. Even if the situation doesn't change. 
And that's what I'm asking you to do. Let it no longer be my problem. Let it be no longer a weight for me to carry around. Let, let it be no longer my, my, uh, I, I can't even think of the word. But anyway, let it be no longer my situation. Let me live my life. Let me enjoy the abundant life you gave me no matter where he's at. Because I'm still an individual. Sure enough. From that day on, that very next day, Kirk came home looking all heavy with condemnation. And I knew it. I could, I could tell by the way he looked that he went and did it again. And it was happening at least a couple of times a week, y'all, for eight years of marriage. So what the Lord showed me was you can be in the middle of a painful situation but if you stick close to me, I can remove the pain. You can be a middle, in the middle of a heavy situation, but if you stick close to me, I can remove the weight. You can be in the middle of a heavy situation, but if you stick close to me, my light will dispel that darkness and it will not have power over you. That was such a blessing. I stopped, the emotional compulsive eating came to a screeching halt. All of the anxiety was gone. It was as if I never went through anything. And I, from that day on, I was in perfect peace. Not just a little peace. I was in perfect peace. And I'm telling you, I went that next five years of that marriage, the last five years of the eight-year marriage, I was living the abundant life, y'all. I could care less what they thought anymore. I wasn't worried about the, the scuttlebutt going around the church. I wasn't worried about what Kirk was doing or who he was doing it to. It got to the point it started to become funny at times. There were very funny moments. Like one night when he was, he got a call from his girlfriend in the middle of the night. And I went to the restroom and I went back to bed. And then I realized, where's Kirk? And I, I was just curious. It wasn't out of anxiety. It was mischievous curiosity. And I got up and tiptoed to the kitchen door and he was sitting on the floor talking on the phone with his girlfriend. Now he had graduated from, from paying prostitutes to a full-blown extramarital affair. And he sounded so stupid on the phone talking to his girlfriend. I said, Lord, they sound like two 15-year-olds talking nonsense. And I had to go back to the bath, to the bedroom and close the door because I was cracking up. I said, Lord, thank you. This no longer bothers me. And then the Lord removed the love. And that was the sign I had put before him. When you want me, when you're giving me permission to divorce him on your time, on your clock, fullness of time, I will divorce him, but I need the sign of the love gone. And I woke up one day and realized I no longer loved. I no longer was nothing there. It was like I was in the house with a roommate. And it was really beautiful because the divorce was peaceful. Everything went fine. No ripples, no negative you know, repercussions, no nothing. And God protected me from getting AIDS and, and, and uh, uh, sexual diseases of any kind, according to my prayers. And I don't know what Kirk ended up with, but I didn't end up with anything. Thank God. And the last five years were blissful. In the middle of the darkness, my days were bright and shiny, y'all. You hear me? So you can choose to let God's light in by opening the blinds and getting in his face. Or you can choose to wallow in the darkness in your self-pity. It's up to you. But I'm going to tell you, if you get in God's light, it doesn't have to be your problem. It can just be a blessing in the middle of the problem. You hear me? Milton going through his blindness felt blessed to have me as a wife. And I was blessed to have him as a husband. So it doesn't have to be an ugly affair. It can be beautiful. When Milton was dying on his deathbed for 33 days after he got the 
the, uh, what do you call it, the diagnosis of the tumor on the brain. And they couldn't operate because of his heart, not because of the tumor. And Milton didn't want the operation, neither did his oldest son nor I. So we were all in agreement, and we all just decided to trust God. What did God do in the middle of that? He gave me a dream that Milton was looking up at me from his from his bed downstairs saying, baby, I'm so tired. He was almost apologizing for wanting to go and be with the Lord. And that was God's way of letting me know, don't pray for his healing. He wants to come be with me. And I told Milton, if you want me to pray for you, I will. If you don't want me to pray for you, don't ask me to pray for you. And I won't. I will not go against your will. Milton never was the first time in our marriage that he did not ask me to pray for him. So I knew that confirmed that that dream was from God. So when the harder you lean on God, the more beautiful a dark moment can be. During the time that, that, that 33 days, Milton and I had the most beautiful times of a love fest. We would shower each other with our love. We would, I mean, the things that, that we shared, the tears, the hugs, it was so beautiful while it was painful. It was beautiful. I don't know if you could understand that, but when God's in something, I'm telling you, it can be amazing. Your darkness could end up being a paradise in God's hand. So put it all in his hand. The Bible says casting all your care on him because he cares for you. You've got to lean harder. You've got to cry out louder. You've got to stick closer to him than you can to your own flesh. And you will go through. You will go in, come out on the other end just fine. You hear me? Trust God through it all. As, as what's his name saying? Um, Andre Crouch. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to lean on him. I got the words mixed up, but through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on his word. Depend on God. You hear me? Lean on him. Ask him questions. Ask him to show you things, give you enlightenment while you're going through the darkness. He'll get you through totally unscathed. God bless you. Be encouraged and know that the darkness will no longer have power over you because of God's light. Amen. Amen.